Good morning, all. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in for the PMI PCC knowledge sharing session. Uh, this is one of the many uh, that we are having as a series every month, right from when the lockdown started. So uh, we are at uh, we have a good number of participants right now, and we are at 10:32. So uh, without uh, wasting much time, let's begin the session. Um, are we ready, JP? Let's begin. So uh, this year, PMI PCC is celebrating the 9th birthday, and um, that was on August 14th. Right now, we are in the 20th year, and that's where the 20th year anniversary celebrations have already begun. A welcome, and thank you for that. Let's begin with a short note or introduction to PMI, PMI PCC, and what we are all about, and then we will continue with the session. Next slide, please. Yes. All about PMI, Project Management Institute. Next. We are known more for our certification, the PMI certification and PMI equal to PMP for most of the people who are not in the project management network. We are a group of about 6 lakh members and uh, we have about 1 lakh certified project management professionals across the globe. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is the membership by, uh, background of uh, the PMI, where we are from, how many people in the PMI, the CAPM, ACP, and other certifications as well. We are spread across the entire world, having more than 300 chapters. PMI PCC is one of the nine chapters that is based in India. Next. This is the numbers in the global arena. Next slide, please. Next. We are one of the fastest growing chapters in the region. Uh, as said earlier, uh, it was founded on August 14, 2001. We recently celebrated our 19th birthday. We are governed by a group of uh, 11 volunteer leaders many professionals supporting the chapter. We started off with 25 members and we are close to 1,200 members now. Next slide, please. These are the board members that I was talking about, Madhav Reddy, the president, Venkar, uh, his vice president, Komal, the secretary general, and the rest of the board members support in each of the portfolios listed. Next, Next slide, please. This is the journey that you have been seeing uh, just before the start of the session, the entire video that you saw, the 19 golden years of PMI PCC. Next. This is the member count and where the members are from, mostly predominantly the IT industry, the construction, financial services, the energy sector, healthcare follow closely. Next slide, please. What we do, we are uh, into advocacy of project management. We are dealing with industry-specific project management workshops. We started the group as well. We are into corporate outreach. We do a lot of conferences and events, mentoring of project management professionals who are new into the industry. We are into uh, a lot of uh, social good activities as well, the education foundation and other activities. And of course, the flagship programs uh, we conduct workshops as well, PMP, ACP, and other certifications. Next. This is a snapshot of the calendar of events that we do, the network meetings, AGM, knowledge sharing sessions, the Gyan Lahiri, that is our flagship program, International Student Leadership Day, Know Your Chapter, so on and so forth. Next. These are the chapter benefits. I'm sure most of the people are PMI members as well as chapter members. You get a whole lot of new benefits when you are being a chap, uh, part of the local chapter as well. Next. Next. This year, we have gone completely virtual and we have added quite a few programs into our bouquet. The masterclass, knowledge sharing sessions, the career enabler series, so on and so forth. Let's quickly run through them. These are the Career Enabler Series. Next. The Masterclass Series, the International Women's Day, 
we did the pledge as well as uh, a master class series that we have been doing next these are the knowledge sharing sessions today what you are seeing is the continuation of the knowledge sharing session and it's on gig economy next academy does quite a few uh, pmt programs as well as preparing people for the pmt certification introducing them to the pmt certification programs as well next the PMT Kickstart program is what the academy does to help people orient towards the PMT certification exam. Next. We do a lot of new member orientation sessions every quarter so that more and more uh, members know all about the activities of the chapter. Next. This is the chapter members network meeting which we recently conducted on July 25th. We hold it every alternate month. Next. Uh, this is something that we started recently. We were talking about the people from different domains. We have started industry specific groups on six domains currently, and we are in the process of getting registrations for it. We will be starting the group soon. Next. These are the social good initiatives that I was talking about. One of the many, uh, we have associations with NIRD, Indian Farmers Association, Terra, and quite a lot of others. Um, associations as well. Next. This is something that we do on a global scale. Uh, we are a part of uh, PMI Education Foundation as well, and one of our board members leads it. Next. This is the chapter newsletter Pandana. Uh, you can find this in our chapter website under newsletter. Uh, this is the Independence Day edition that we had brought in, and uh, I'm sure you'll find very good readings of it. Uh, we can share the link for you in the chat box if you're interested. Next. This is a, a new project that we had started from PMI PCC. Uh, some of our board members as well as volunteers contributed to it. The project management book in Telugu for the locals. Next. Uh, this is a, a, a initiative that is started by one of our uh, board members, and it is on empowering uh, women in project management on a R11 level. That is the nine chapters of India as well as Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Next. This is our YouTube channel, and before you ask, uh, even before the start of the session, uh, let me tell you the recordings of the event will be shared uh, in the YouTube channel. You may go through even now. You have the rest of the event activities as well. Next. Uh, this is a snapshot of the events that happen. Uh, we will be sharing the September event soon on the website as well. Yeah. Next. OK. Um, you can uh, cross this. Next. Next. This is all about the members. And I just rushed through the PMI and the PMI PCC introduction so that everyone can get a snapshot regarding all the activities of the chapter. And now let's go to the actual session. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, let me just uh, begin um, the topic. Uh, today's topic is on gig economy. A lot of us uh, might be hearing about uh, gigs. Uh, some of us may not be aware. We did a quick survey. And most of us are open to gigs. So now let's understand uh, from Gopal what it is all about. But before that, let me just say, uh, introduce Gopal to everyone so that uh, each of us is aware of uh, Gopal. Gopal is a senior uh, seasoned talent leader with over 17 years of experience working with large multinational organizations across various industries and geographies. Currently, Gopal works with Ernst & Young. He leads the Gig Now, a program that, is, that has a specific focus on attracting and engaging with people for gig assignments at Ernst & Young. He is a strategic management consultant a management postgraduate uh, from the prestigious IIM Koi and he's also a global 
Human Resource Professional, GPHR, a Certified Career Transitions Coach, Certified Executive Coach, AB NLP, Certified NLP Practitioner as well. He is a speaker in various HR forums and has spoken on numerous topics on the future skills in the world of HR, the future of work, the rise of the gig economy, the relevance of the relevance of current skills and how the business and talent landscape would change by 2015. So without much further ado, let me um, hand over to Gopal. Gopal, over to you. Uh, could you pass on the presentation rights to me? That's okay. Gopal, it is with you now. Perfect. Hold on one second. Can you all um, see the slides as well? Yes, we see. Yes, yes, Gopal. All right. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, <clears throat> firstly, thank you uh, so much, uh, PMI uh, PCC chapter. Uh, really appreciate um, the opportunity. Uh, I think uh, the topic that we have today is uh, extremely timely for what we are going through. So, uh, in the next 45 to 50 minutes, I will be sharing uh, the the specifics of what we believe as as the workforce is changing. Um, and what we need to do uh, to adapt uh, to the uh, the new realities of working. Um, so thank you. If everyone can go on mute, that would really help. Uh, I think quite a bit of background sound. Okay, uh, Gopal, uh, just uh, can you put this in the uh, slideshow mode? Uh, we are seeing the. Oh, is it okay? Hold on one second. I have a dual monitor, <laughs> so I think it went on to the other one. Hold on one. Give me a few seconds. Okay. Yes. Share my screen. All right, this should help now. Is this full? Is this on the full screen screen now? Perfect. Brilliant. Uh, okay. So um, again, once again, thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, and I sincerely hope that all of you are um, staying safe wherever you are. Uh, I think what we are going through is not an easy time. Um, and, and the world is completely virtual right now. So uh, that's what we're gonna see here, uh, talk through, and I'll be more than happy to take questions uh, along. Feel free to put them onto the Q&A section and I'll, I'll take it at the end. Um, and also if there are any um, audio questions, I will be happy to uh, take them uh, as well. Okay, um, let me start. So. In, in the presentation today, we'll quickly uh, touch upon what we are going through uh, in the last six months, especially with with the COVID realities, um, the Industry 4.0 and the COVID-19 um, uh, in, in, in conjunction and how it's impacting the world, uh, the modern workforce, the expectations, um, the gig economy, the why, the what, and the how of a career as a freelancer, and um, a little bit about our program within EY as to what we do in this uh, entire um, space. So um, I think uh, what we are seeing in the last uh, six months at least, or probably eight months if you were to really look at uh, China and, and the overall realities is, as well is that it's, it's a kind of a pandemic situation that none of us in the, in the call today or probably in the living history would have uh, seen. We have seen um, uh, health, health issues, health crises like 
uh, maybe the SARS uh, that we saw or even um, the Nipah virus uh, that some of us saw in, in some of the southern part of, parts of India or any of these in the in the recent past. But uh, I don't think uh, it, anything of this magnitude was something that the world was ready for. Uh, at the same time, we also saw uh, economic crisis uh, uh, every every eight to twelve years. Um, the last one we saw was in two thousand eight, which was a big global one. Uh, and I think every country since then has seen or continue to see a lot of um, crises after crises. Um, and and I think this one, in the current scheme of things, is a global economic and a health crisis all at once, uh, which has put tremendous amount of pressure in many industries as we speak, uh, and and that has resulted into a potential unemployment um, of up to 25 million jobs worldwide. Uh, and this number probably is just going to continue to rise. And I think it's it's not something that we would have probably anticipated, but that's a reality that we are all looking uh, happening around us. Um, how has it impacted our businesses? Um, I think with the lockdown and the uh, prolonged lockdowns or or um, versions of lockdowns that we all saw in India as well, and probably the world uh, saw it, it, it something very similar in respective countries, it led to business closures temporarily. It also led to customers, I mean, losing customers uh, due to economic slowdown. And uh, there was, during the lockdown at least, high demand and lack of supply. But if you look at it from an overall perspective, uh, I think the patterns, the behaviors of customers have changed. And the reason for that is, um, I think uh, we all are not doing what we used to do uh, probably pre-COVID days. For example, uh, aviation sector has, has been hit badly. Hospitality as a sector has been hit badly. Manufacturing as a sector, depending on uh, which, which consumer segment that they are part of, has been hit badly. And I think this is resulting into a lot of economic um, uh, challenges where cash flow is a concern because a lot of industries that had manufactured a lot of goods have taken quite a bit of cash uh, into into their books but are not able to sell as, as they would have wanted to and is resulting into increase in debts as well. Um, so from an overall economics perspective, overall sector perspective, there are challenges that we are all going through. It will probably remain for a brief period of up to six to 18 months, and maybe newer paradigms will be defined where I think the businesses will start growing in a different manner, which we all are calling as next normal. Um, this has a direct impact on employees, job seekers, people like you and me who are either working in organizations or are, are gonna work in organizations where I think uh, campus, if I were to talk about Took a huge hit in the in the last six months, where people, uh, a lot of organizations couldn't honor the offers. Uh, a lot of organizations probably deferred the date of joinings because um, exams weren't conducted, and continues to be a challenge even now. Academic years got shifted, um, and likewise, a lot of organizations couldn't onboard people because their entire practice of onboarding was live. It had to move virtual. There had to be new processes that had to be defined new logistics that had to be taken care of in terms of delivering laptops to homes uh, and, and newer uh, technology platforms that we had to uh, really take care of, like Zooms and the WebExes and probably Teams of the world. And I think this has, in a way, completely changed the way we uh, onboard people and will continue to evolve in through next six to 18 months as to how to make it better. And I, I think it has, it has also challenged a lot of our assumptions, uh, in, and including relevance of practices that we were following even pre-COVID uh, world. Uh, and, and a lot of organizations have decided that they will continue the work from home even beyond the lockdown in certain countries. Uh, like TCS made an, uh, a statement that they will be 25% by 25, which is 2025. Um, uh, Google made similar, uh, EY has, has probably kept the same stance where we probably are still working from home and we're waiting for uh, what what we have in store in terms of vaccine and then we will decide. So I think, and we were, by the way, working from home any which ways, at least for two days a week, even before uh, uh, COVID happened. So I think the world is moving virtual and we need to adapt our practices to uh, uh, 
be be uh, relevant for that particular uh, situation. Uh, it also led to temporary hiring freeze. Uh, work from home has has become now a normal, uh, of course, except the manufacturing sectors. And this has resulted into a lot of changes in policies. New policies had to be rewritten for work from home support, internet allowances. Uh, a lot of organizations had to take pay cut because they were not making enough revenue. Uh, and also this will result into ongoing dialogue on how do I change the uh, lab labor law or legal structure because what used to be an organization in a particular space or a building has now become uh, an organization that is virtual. So I'm sitting at home and probably working uh, and and I think uh, like me in in my apartments, there are several others sitting and working for respective organizations. So I think uh, the element of office spaces and the element of taxation around it or financial implications around it are going to continue to evolve in the next couple of years. And this is not just in India across the world. So we'll it will be interesting to see what happens from here on. Um, so we are, all have seen uh, that uh, the realities that we are in today uh, is not the same reality that existed before, which is pre-COVID and post-COVID, as as many speak. And and we are kind of going through the COVID era, and everyone has now started talking about new normal, next normal. And I think the question really is, what's after what next? Um, and I think we need to really ask these questions um, and and find a way to respond to the situation pretty pretty soon. Um, in terms of the industrial revolution in itself, um, we we continue to evolve even before COVID, right? I mean, I think 1.0, uh, 2.0, 3.0 are all realities that we are all very well aware. Even 4.0, as we are all going through, uh, continue to evolve in the last eight to ten years with with so much of emphasis on the 2G, 3G, 4G, uh, uh, high speed internet connections, uh, connectivity across uh, the whole country, and uh, and the entire ecosystem of digital platforms, the app uh, uh, apps for iOS and Androids or or digital devices that made sure that we are connected a lot more better than before was the focus uh, for a long longest period but i think with covid all of those initiatives have just been amplified because what was probably in my uh, tech uh, improvement radar for 2025 or 2030 in terms of, in terms of my focus and and the spend uh, became 2020 because that was there was no other way or no practical way for me to survive through uh, an extremely challenging situation like this and I think collaborative tools have to be really given kudos uh, that it enables almost every sector still to continue working the way, at least not the way before, but at least in a in many ways better than how it used to be uh, in the pre-COVID world. Um, it, and it has impacted education. It had, it has impacted us uh, working wo working pro as working professionals. And gig economy or remote working or remote workers are no different. And we'll talk a lot more about that in the next few slides. So even while the the overall industrialization was happening, there was always a demographic shift uh, in and in terms of expectations from the modern workforce. Uh, flexibility was becoming most almost the need of the hour for for a lot of people. Uh, long commute hours, um, I think long working hours was making it extremely difficult and leading into a lot of attrition uh, even as we were going through in the last five to eight years. Um, so flexibility is of utmost important. People uh, believed in organization that worked on purpose. Uh, and I think uh, it was always about meaningful experiences uh, and growth opportunities for the workforce that we uh, we talk about today. Um, we always want, and the, uh, the workforce today wants adaptive work environment where the culture is adapted to meet employee expectations. Uh, and there is, I mean, take up any article, any research paper today, it's all organizations working towards best in class employee experience. Um, adaptive learning, and I think um, gone are the days of, uh, and especially in the COVID world, uh, gone are the days of classroom based learning sessions where you take your time off for two days 
and and sit and do these 16 hours of sessions uh, it's all about digital learnings as self-paced learnings and i think a lot of organizations have continued to invest in that um, and evi has done phenomenal uh, work in that space as well with regards to uh, introducing the badges program where we en ensure that people are uh, getting upskilled to to be ready for the new new ways of working um, and i think empowerment continued to be the key area of focus uh, personal development continued to be a uh, key areas of focus even even before covid where it was always about best in class rewards best in class performance management process uh, immediate feedback uh, and and uh, recognition, uh, if I were to say, um, uh, a sense of a belonging and sense of appreciation that that a lot of organizations had continued to focus as well. And uh, I think one realization that has happened in the last eight to 10 years has been that you invest in your people and they'll take care of the customers. So um, unless your employees are not happy, uh, the the way um, the customers we were treated was was not going to work any which ways. And I think the best of the organizations or best of the uh, organizations in the business are the ones who have happy people. So I think these these were the shifts that we were seeing any which ways in the last uh, seven to eight years or or, or a little more. Uh, but all of that, along with uh, the change that we are also seeing. Uh, with with regards to the world of work, uh, technology has started playing a huge role in in the in the way we are working. Innovation is at the heart of many of the organizations. Uh, there has been an extreme amount of focus on making organizational and work organizations and workplaces a lot more inclusive uh, to people who were not included in the past. So make it accessible for people. Uh, people with disabilities, people in general about um, uh, communities that were not involved in the past, uh, and and so on. Workplaces have become a lot more flexible, which means work from home was becoming popular a lot more in India as well. Uh, collaboration was given uh, extreme amount of focus. Uh, no more you can you can work in an organization in silos. You had to learn the art of working with a team. And remote working was gaining popularity as well and continues to gain uh, a lot more pop popularity even now as we speak. A workforce in itself, um, there was a lot of automation that was happening, a uh, lot of diverse talent that were brought in. And I think there is one stat that says the organizational workforce today has at least five generations of workforce, uh, which means you have someone who is a 60 plus, you have someone who is a 20 year old. And I think that is bringing in a lot of diversity in the way Teaming happens, um, and and also how uh, how eventually the work happens as well. Um, Work-life balance is the top agenda, and changing demographics um, is is also the fact that we are uh, seeing as well. Uh, Suma, do you want me to stop the video? If I, I I heard some of, I mean, I read some of the comments. Uh, not an issue, Gopal. Uh, uh, okay. Let's see how it goes. Uh, okay. We don't sure. have any screening issue here. Sure, sure, sure. All right. Um, independence workforce. Uh, I would like to uh, share share my own personal story in this, and I think um, uh, if I were to uh, give uh, my family background in this in this forum, my grandfather uh, was a small time villager in in a particular. Uh, uh, town in Kerala called Palakkad, and uh, he used to be someone who used to uh, be a grocery um, uh, shop owner, and he used to travel across five set, five uh, states in India to source goods and continue to be uh, selling uh, in the selling of goods business, uh, at least from a grocery standpoint, for the longest period of time, at least throughout his career. Um, and I think the, I'm talking about 1930s to 1950s, 55s where I think predominantly as a country, we were into the space of um, into the space of uh, agriculture or agricultural goods um, and, and manufacturing as such had not picked up. I think my dad um, uh, moved to Mumbai in 1964 and, and I think he started looking, looking for a job and he found one in an automotive industry and he worked into that uh, in that organization till about 2003 so 42 years of service something that he's really proud about and he was really really proud about 
And uh, the, the stark difference in the way my grandfather and my dad uh, uh, looked at their careers, if I were to talk about, was very different. While there was a lot of independence in the way um, my grandfather worked uh, in terms of whatever he did for his business, my dad and my, my mom as well uh, continued to work for organizations where it was all about working for uh, organizations that needed you to come to a workplace and and uh, be on site, uh, and the work that used to happen was more of need-based kind of roles. There were very there was very little flexibility in terms of what you could do, so which de which determined uh, the working hours that they had to uh, work, um, the cycles of the business determined um, how they got paid as well, uh, and also there was there was very little flexibility in terms of. You cannot take your uh, uh, books of accounts or or any of the papers to home and continue working, um, or or think about working from home unless, of course, there was a, a real health situation or a, or a maternity uh, situation, where again there was. I mean, no one was very pro to the idea of working from home then. Uh, and if if uh, if you are in a particular city or a town uh, and the work location happens to be in a different city or a town, you migrated, which is what led to a lot of migration in the old olden days, even up till COVID. I mean, I would say a lot of uh, workers used to move to workplaces because of uh, in, in search of opportunity. Um, if, if you look at how things started changing, and I think the more uh, globalized we became as an economy, uh, be it in 1992, which is which was the largest and biggest, uh, where uh, we opened up our doors to global um, players, uh, a lot of private sector units bloomed. Uh, and I think public sector units started seeing a lot of uh, voluntary attrition as well. Uh, people who could find place for themselves in, in private sector units survived and thrived. People who couldn't uh, opted out for becoming freelancers. And, and I think the, the parallel and I, the what I can remember of freelancing in those days was you become an LIC agent or you become someone who could probably be writing columns in newspapers, photographies, uh, you could be a stenotypist, uh, and so on. And I think that, that continued for a long time, and some people eventually found jobs in private sector units as well. Um, then came in 2000 when we saw the Y2K happen, a lot of organizations thought that if they did not invest in Y2K, uh, they, they will go bust. Uh, and eventually when the bubble bursted, a lot of uh, organizations were sitting with excess of uh, staff, staff capacity and probably had no other way but to lay off people. And when they got laid off, they all became uh, contract workers or gig workers in the old way of looking at things. Um, and I think every peaks and valleys has altered the workforce patterns uh, and COVID is no different as well. Of course, the difference between when my dad and my mom started their careers and the way um, a 20 year old is looking uh, today and, and starting his or her career, uh, the external factors and the element of digitization is playing a huge role in the way work is happening. Uh, and work is getting broken down into multiple micro tasks. And we'll, we'll touch upon that in a bit in the next few slides uh, on how as an accountant in 1950s or 60s, you probably did bookkeeping in a very different fashion. Today, you do it in a very different fashion with a lot of automated solutions. So a work that probably required 10 people in 50s probably is getting done with probably two hours of work of one individual. So he or she has to find something else as an addition, which means that we are getting better in what we are doing with, with automation. And of course, we need to find a way to make uh, this a lot more better for ourselves in terms of upskilling and doing a lot more other variety of work that we should be doing. Um, so all of this, is this an unwelcome disruption or a transformational opportunity? We in EY ask these better questions because um, we believe that we are in the in the uh, in in our path to build a better working world, and better working world requires you to ask better questions, and better questions gives us better answers, and better answers allows us to 
build a better working world? And this is one question that we continue to ask ourselves every such situation. Is this an unwelcome dis disruption or a transformational opportunity? And um, if I were to really look at how we have, at least in the services sector, uh, seen the business models evolve, what used to be traditional IT outsourcing uh, moved away from um, uh, the the moved into the remote infrastructure management, and eventually now is all about infrastructure as a service or uh, platform as a service, right? What used to be a legacy and waterfall method of doing uh, projects uh, is now open source, modern, agile, and and probably a lot of uh, ways of working on software as a service today um, is is what we are seeing. BPO, which started off as people-based uh, became industrialized and outcome-based. So call center was uh, a salary job earlier. Today it is number of calls you make, I'll pay you this much. Um, and eventually even there, we have seen business process as a service and platform BPOs thriving and, and, and um, becoming a lot more prominent. People at the end of the day, or talent as we call, were always on site, sitting in office spaces and, and working for uh, the respective organizations. As the uh, outsourcing continued to happen a lot more, today we are all remote and will continue to be remote. Uh, we, of course, are adding the element of outsourcing it, contractor talent, but eventually, and, and we are all seeing this happen at least a lot more in blue collar jobs where talent is on cloud. So your Uber, Ola, Swiggy, uh, Urban Clap are all cloud based platform providers where they are keeping talent on cloud where it doesn't mean uh, where you're working. You could be you could be staying anywhere. You could be working for a client, but at the end of the day, everything happens uh, on on the platform, and the entire orchestration of demand versus supply gets done through the platform. Um, and that's exactly what we are seeing in terms of the contractor models or ways of working changing as well. What used to be the traditional on-premise contracting uh, moved away from uh, that to outcome-based um, contracting where it was management of tasks and workloads, um, which then further evolved to SOW, SLA, KPI-based contracting, where it used to be partially off-premise, mainly on-premise. Uh, but now with digital platforms that are available, we are seeing a lot of subtasks, microservices, microtasks getting crowdsourced to freelancers, crowdsourcing vendors, platforms, crowdsourced communities. Uh, and, and, and I think if you really look at the way the work is happening, it's, it's all getting orchestrated beautifully through a platform which has a backing of AI and ML, which, which also uh, takes care of how the work gets awarded as well, how the work gets done as well, how you're managing the performance as well, and how are you getting paid as well. So I think this is, this is gonna continue to evolve as we see through the next few years. And maybe a lot of organizations will continue to manage their full-time staff as well through models like these. Uh, and I think it will, it will eventually become the way of working. Um, uh, and I think uh, if the, the closest parallel that I can draw is when uh, in 1980s, my, my dad was told, um, uh, we are introducing computers into our organization, so go learn computers. And uh, everybody started staring at each other thinking that what just happened? Uh, and I think people who did found themselves better opportunities. Uh, people who didn't probably struggled uh, a, a lot uh, and continue to be in the book and paper way of working. Uh, and I think the opportunity that we have right now is are we gonna be able to adapt to the new ways of working? And I think the more open we are, the more adapt, uh, the more we adapt and the more we adopt this ways of working, it will be better for all of us in the near future. So how is gig economy different than contracting? Um, contracting used to happen between people. So one party working closely with the other party, they would drop a contract. It used to be a email conversation or a telephonic conversation and continues to be like that. Uh, and, and everything used to get uh, delivered uh, through either a staff augmentation model or a body shopping model, or or even uh, in in uh, in in general of uh, even in the BPO space, even though it was remote, it was still managed 
physically uh, by by many means but what is happening with the digitization is it is allowing us an opportunity to orchestrate an entire um, relationship between freelancers gig workers and that with an organization and it gives us the the better pricing at the end of the day uh, for both the uh, employee and the employer because there is no middleman here who is who is really working for margins in the space um, and and i think it gives a lot of empowerment to both organizations and the freelancers or gig workers to be able to get the best for themselves even though it's at a transactional level so i think the dig digital experience is going to continue to grow uh, and we will see a lot more um, in this space in the next few years um so who is a freelancer and and when we talk about um, gig workers or freelancers it's a person at, at the end of the day who is looking at being self-employed seeks short-term assignments um, and is not committed to a single employer for a longer term uh, these individuals may engage with more than one company depending on the nature and the engagement of the contract typically works remotely managing 24 by 7 versus a full-time employee who would work eight to nine hours a day or a 40 to 45 hours per week um, and as much as it sounds very different uh, than what what we are uh, used to here the biggest element of uh, differentiation also is by who is getting into the roles of freelancer so you could be a hobby worker uh, you could probably um, work uh, on gigs as a hobby um, people who can sing who can uh, write blogs who can uh, shoot videos short videos in into the business of um, uh, motivational speaking, etc. A uh, gold gig worker, someone who could probably look at full-time jobs, but also pick up additional gigs to meet additional income needs. Uh, this is a bit of a challenge in the current scheme of things in India because of the way our labor laws are written. But probably in the next few years, it, this will change as well. Uh, part-time gig worker, self-employed individuals who pick up one or more part-time gig assignments. This happens a lot in India. Uh, especially in the India on ink space, if I were to say so, uh, where everything is is with a view of um, I'm doing this and I'm doing that I'm, and I'm doing that as well. Uh, and a classic example would be my wife who happens to teach music as well as uh, he, she teaches Zumba. And I think uh, she balances it out both in terms of her schedules and continues to do both. Um, and stopgap gig worker, so someone who um, was working for a long time uh, probably lost a job and 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 wants to focus on picking up gigs immediately to continue to uh, fund for themselves for the next few months and eventually when he or she gets a full-time job stops being a gig worker career gig worker someone who has picked up primary gig and many other gigs as a solopreneur and agency freelancer uh, and I think if you if you look at this more from a perspective of what India needs today uh, and this is wonderfully put by our prime minister as well in in his idea of self-reliant India. The the amount of jobs that we are seeing versus the amount of people that we have, it's completely disproportionate. And unless and until we don't really challenge ourselves, uh, unless unless and until we don't really look at careers beyond full-time jobs, we will continue to have challenges where we will see a lot of people being unemployed. Unemployment is more like a mindset, and I think we should really change that by uh, uh, picking up gig assignments and, and finding um, something for ourselves which pays it pays us as well. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that. How do you go about doing that in the next few slides as well? But um, these are the personas that we see. And what is in it for gig workers or freelancer is, um, is uh, yeah, I'll, I'll touch upon this. So you get freedom. You have the flexibility, you get to choose your clients, you have the work-life balance that you need it. Uh, you're not tied to one location at all. You can, you can continue to look at working in multiple locations uh, with the world being virtual today. I think you can work from anywhere for a client based out of anywhere. Uh, you continue to focus on your health goals and become, um, become the best you uh, in, uh, while you're working for clients uh, at the pace that, that you want. And you define your own income. Like if you think you you need to make two lakhs a month, you decide what you want to be doing and how you want to be doing and 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 uh, work through that entire piece yourselves. And I think 
all of this provides great amount of autonomy, great amount of empowerment to you as an individual when when you look at um, doing um, gig work. Uh, uh, gig work. Uh, and if I were to really look at uh, just one more aspect of it is online freelancing that we are all seeing today uh, with the rise of uh, remote working and, and the, the amount of platforms that we have um, is India is going to see a lot of change in the next couple of years, um, and 50% of India's workforce will comprise uh, of, of freelancers. Um, and I think India is the largest freelancer market any which ways, like it, like it or not, not like it, or know it or you don't know. Um, uh, there is there is a stat that a lot of organizations or platforms uh, that are live today, based out of various countries has highest number of registrants that are from India, and they are working for clients based out of anywhere in the world and making great money for themselves. Excuse me. Um, over 40% of Indian freelancers surveyed by e-payment firm PayPal saw that businesses have grown faster in the last one year. And I think this is something that is extremely encouraging. But as we see a lot more freelancers getting in, the numbers will become extremely competitive as well and the client and the individual will get the best experience um, on both the sides. Um, so if, if uh, we were to look at that. So another better question that I would like to ask, uh, and it would be interesting to hear and uh, uh, see the perspectives, what do we think uh, will be more important in the future? Is it the right skill set or right mindset? You can put in your comments in there. Wonderful. I agree. Uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, we need we need the right skill set and the right mindset to be able to continue uh, moving towards a better future. Uh, we are all focusing so much on having the right skills. Um, and, and I think uh, there are a lot of uh, organizations that are playing uh, wonderful roles. If I were to think about Coursera's or Udemy's or, or Upgrad in India or, or, and several such that are working towards upskilling, reskilling. Uh, but I think um, a lot of importance has also to be given to having the right mindset. You can have the best skills in the world, but if you don't have the right mindset, it's probably not going to work as well. So it's it's combination of both, but I would tilt a little more towards the mindset piece as well, especially where we are given the gig gig world and gig economy um, in terms of what we need to do to be able to catch up uh, compared to the rest of the world in this space. So how do you shift from being an employee to a self-employed individual? Um, first things first, we need to really understand what's involved in a gig. Uh, we need to ensure that we manage the work time uh, and work from home uh, and remote working really well. Um, technology, workspace, having the right internet connection, having the right tools, um, et cetera, needs to be extremely um, uh, carefully selected and done as well. Um, someone, When someone moves away from getting monthly salaries to suddenly looking at getting piecemeal um, uh, uh, income. Uh, so it could be, I make 1,000 rupees today, I make 2,000 rupees tomorrow, I make 5 lakh the third day. Uh, it becomes an extremely important task to keep a track of the income because otherwise you, you, will, you will continue to um, uh, lose sight of how much you're earning or, and how much you're spending. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in India, of course, is the fact that we are all not enough in, insured for health insurance. And, and, and I think COVID has really um, put that extreme pressure in a lot of people who were relying solely on, um, uh, on organizational insurances. And when they suddenly lost jobs, they couldn't find themselves having right insurance coverage. And uh, unfortunately, in the COVID situation, when there was a hospitalization, uh, they were kind of putting their entire savings into the health uh, situation. So having the right budget for the right insurance, uh, how to prioritize the work accordingly, 
um, and also start connecting with influential people who can make introductions and referrals. And we'll talk about networking in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. And I think if I were to add uh, some more bit into this, is uh, as an employee, um, when I am looking to make a transition to becoming self-employed, and this happens either by choice or also by force at times, given the current scenario, um, one of the uh, things that people often uh, do not realize is uh, looking for gig opportunities is not similar to that of looking for jobs. So uh, the way you pitch your work is, is going to look very different. Um, CVs won't help. Uh, the way you talk about your experiences has to also evolve. Your 25 years of work experiences may not really add value. Uh, it also, I mean, I mean, I would say add value in a way. How is it that's going to create a value proposition for for the end client or ultimate customer to say, this is what I have done and this is what I could do for you. And these are my skill sets and this is what my credibility in this uh, business is. And you can talk to my um, uh, couple of people who who I have worked with in the past for, for references and, and see what they have to say. And I think a lot of... Uh, change management in that is yet to be seen in a country like India, where we still continue to explore job opportunities or gig opportunities, like we would explore um, um, a career change while we are still as a, a full-time worker. So I think that's a huge mindset shift that we need to really keep in mind as we uh, make, make a decision to become self-employed. Um, yeah, and I think becoming a freelancer, uh, I think, is is not going to be an easy one if we don't have the right mindset, right? And I think uh, a lot of times what happens is uh, we are used to uh, a certain number of years of work experience. It could be 15, 20, 25, depending on when we make that call to become a freelancer or an entrepreneur, if I were to say. Uh, it is extremely important that we remain committed no matter what, right? Uh, we need to have a goal plan, need to figure out what our goals should be, how should it um, sh how should it work in the COVID scenario for the next six months, what should I be doing for the next 12 to 18 months and beyond, and stay focused in that goals. Make a business plan and follow it. Uh, and I think you may have to apply the agile principles where you need to ensure that you learn fast, fail fast, fail better, learn better. And I think continue to make point progress, but make progress. Do not quit. Um, set priorities and be productive. Uh, extremely important. Create an action plan and a timeline. Uh, again, something that uh, is, is extremely important. And we often lose sight of, of all of these subtle nuances. Practice patience. Uh, a lot of people who make that switch from being a uh, being a full-time worker to becoming a freelancer often give up pretty soon because they can't figure out a way to make that one sale. Uh, it could be one project, it could be one small um, a micro project, or it could be even a, 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 a free project. Uh, that one sale is, is um, a, a, at times it becomes extremely difficult for people to find an opportunity for themselves. Problem solving with yourselves. Um, and I think it's extremely important to have right coaches by you, right, uh, right counselors and right network of influencers by you to have conversations at the right point of time to ensure that you get the perspectives that you may be missing when you're looking at it yourselves. Be your own boss. And I think um, extremely important that, that we, we feel empowered uh, ourselves to be able to uh, make the right decisions uh, at times uh, as no matter how senior we are in our careers, uh, we have always had someone to uh, look up to or, or someone to go to and ask him or her to solve it for us or take you out of that situation and put, put, it in, put you in a better place. But when you're in a free, uh, freelancing uh, role or an entrepreneurial role, you've got to really empower yourself because you're, you're going to be all alone on, or you've got to be responsible for a bulk of people or a bunch of people that are working with you in your entrepreneurial uh, uh, venture. 
So how do you uh, take care of yourself and be your own boss? Be mindful and accept the situation the way it is. And I think you will continue to make progress and repraise negative thoughts. Uh, extremely important in a situation and a, and a climate and a weather like this, where uh, opportunities are hard to come by, uh, very easy for us to get uh, sucked into the world of negativity. Uh, let, let negativity not really bog you down. And I think, have, as I said, have the right set of influencers, people who uh, care for you, uh, continue to look uh, to give you the right guidance that you need to be able to move into the um, gig mindset, if I were to say. Um, how do you become a successful freelancer? So manage pro projects successfully um, in, in freelancing by defining the goals and objectives, maintain a project tracker. Uh, and I think it's extremely important when you are, I mean, as you, I mean, you are all in some form practicing project management uh, professionals as well. Uh, you would uh, understand this a lot more better than I'm explaining this to you probably. But most importantly, when you're working for multiple multiple clients, maintain a good project tracker. Uh, communicate with your clients a lot more often than how you would typically be, uh, because you're now all, all you're not going to be all on your own. And importance of communication. Uh, when you're a freelancer is a lot more higher because um, one, we are already working in a virtual world. Two, uh, if the client doesn't get to get to understand where we are in terms of progress that we are making or the challenges that we are facing, it's, it's not going to be uh, of any help. So how do we do that? Address any problems before even they occur. Uh, have a better time management proce uh, process because imagine yourself as a, as a gig project manager working for multiple clients at one go, uh, both equally demanding. Um, if we don't really know <coughs> how to say no, uh, it will become a challenge. And, and I think we need to find a way to better manage our time. <coughs> Excuse me. And also find ways to ensure you get paid timely. Right? Excuse me. So the next aspect is understanding the challenges and solutions of. Um, are you are you able to hear me? Yes, we can okay. Hear. Okay. Yeah. So um, when we are working in a virtual world, and when we are working in the business of platforms, uh, and and I think um, be it gig now. Uh, for that of EY or uh, other platform providers like Upwork, Topcoder, Kaggle, uh, Fiverr, Freelance.com, and so on. Um, it's extremely important that we know that we have to attract client. Uh, no one is going to come and give work to us. Uh, imagine yourselves at this point of time as, as an Uber driver, unless you don't turn on the app on, uh, you will not be awarded work because if the app is off, if you're not online, uh, I think uh, you will. You, you, I mean, you lose the opportunity to uh, get the business. But in in the white collar job space, how do you make sure that you become uh, someone who becomes um, the preferred gig worker of choice by a lot more? And and a lot of emphasis is given to credibility ratings here. Um, so go to any freelance platforms, uh, freelancing platforms today. Uh, they all thrive on um, letting you in as a gig worker only when they know that you are good enough to be a gig worker on their platform because client satisfaction is of utmost importance for them. Uh, so how do, you, how do we work towards attracting clients uh, in the best way, um, especially when we are new and, and trying to transition into this space where we don't have a, a credibility rating enough to be able to uh, work through. Develop your online presence, be it LinkedIn, be it Instagram, be it Facebook, be it YouTube. Uh, people need to see what you do uh, across online platforms today. Uh, I think gone are the days when we used to say, yeah, I have a profile on LinkedIn. I don't go, go really to make any updates to it. Um, um, uh, people will know what I do through the work that I do. But we all need to understand that we are living in a virtual world now. And I think it's, it's 
imperative that we are developing a presence where people get to see us and that's the only way that we can allow people to see us establish yourself as an expert uh, be it any field uh, even within the project management field why should someone hire person a versus person b for a small project and i think it's extremely important that we differentiate ourselves in in comparison with the other individual be proactive and i think uh, extremely important fundamental of being a freelancer is being proactive and not be passive uh, because uh, in a, in a in a competitive digital world that we are in i think uh, proactivity pays a huge uh, uh, i would say uh, benefit uh, at the end of the day when we are uh, working through with the clients across the world um, and i think uh, identify ways how you can manage your gaps in the work uh, there could be periods where um, you may not have enough um work to do there could not be enough wins that you will make how do you ensure that you are able to take care of yourselves and your finances during that time and being your own boss we we discussed that a bit uh, earlier in the earlier slide as well um most importantly create your profile and portfolio and i think um, uh as simple as it is to create a linkedin account or um, a facebook account or an insta account or youtube account some of the freelancing websites um require you to build a value proposition um and i think uh, it 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 uh, it is extremely important that we move away from uh, the traditional cv route to um a, a one slider or a one one pager which talks about who you are what you do why do you do what you do uh why should someone really look at you as an expert in this field uh what are some of your uh, key skills how could you make the difference when you were when we when you would be awarded a project um and how competitive are you in terms of your rates um so this requires you to really reimagine the way you have been pitching yourselves in the world of work uh, and i think extremely important for you to think about that um uh in in a different way so build out so think about a niche first uh what is your niche think about uh, uh that in a lot more sense where are you a follower or are you uh, are you someone who is creating a unique path for yourself um build a portfolio um and and create new work for yourself probably best way to start is by offering free work to the clients um and build your credibility and i think the more free work uh, in the first few months of your gig working that we do uh, it becomes extremely important milestone for us to demand more work as we progress uh, but don't forget to ask client testimonials and reviews of after every work that you do um exactly the same way that every uber driver and onola driver would ask you give me the rating um at the end of your ride um add videos and i think extremely important for people to look at who you are how you sound uh, what are your perspectives what your views are um and it probably may require you to probably do 20 25 takes to begin with but get comfortable with that because that's the way people will hear you talk to you hear your views in the digital world uh it may seem that okay if you're going to work the world will be back to normal uh and and i don't really need to do this because i'll again go back to my full time workspace and be be working closely with people in 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 uh, physical ex existence but think about this with a view that by doing this you're opening yourselves opportunities to world of work that lies across the world uh and if you were to think about picking up a work for someone sitting in switzerland or someone sitting in new zealand or australia um he or she is not going to be able to see you physically so uh, adding videos is extremely important write blogs give point of views uh, blog as much as it may sound very tricky tough very is very easy and how do we uh, become an expert in that uh, invest in digital marketing skills because uh, that's something that is becoming a uh, almost uh, non negotiable in in the world that we are living in um, and I'm, i'm i'm myself investing quite a bit in that uh to to improve uh, uh everything that i do uh, myself for the work that i do uh, and of course continue to upskill um 
I mean, there is a stat that says 65 percent of freelancers on an average upskill every year with some of the other new skills or 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 increasing their proficiency in the skill that they are good at. Um, so uh, it's it's a big cultural mindset shift that we have in India where we have always solely and, and uh, always relied on uh, one or two certifications post our graduations or post graduations. Uh, I think today the world is becoming a lot more open and certifications or micro learnings are a lot more affordable today. So I think look for opportunities and continue to upskill as you grow into the world of gig. Um, picking the right projects, um, and I think I will uh, quickly skim through these because these are some things that you all will be great at, I'm guessing, because of the, the portfolio that you're all playing. Uh, and I spoke about this from a testimonials perspective as well. Ask for it. Extremely important when we complete the work. Ask for feedback. Get them to write a few words, if not a long, long blog about the work that you do as well. Because the more you do that, it gives you a word, to, word of mouth element uh, in the digital space. Uh, it helps you to professionally position the work that you do. It helps you to communicate about your work to the newer clients in a lot more easier manner and at least gives you some bit of guarantee because people will see what you have done in the past and will continue to look at how do we um, engage with uh, with this this professional and of course stay professional in your requests when when we are asking for testimonials um, personal branding as I said is extremely important and the reason for that uh, if I were to really look at is um, everything that we do in the digital world uh, even including if you were to think about getting back to a full-time job um, or if you are looking for full-time jobs while you're in a full-time job revolves around your social media presence how do you appear in linkedin how do you appear in facebook how do you appear in uh, instagram uh, are the three profiles talking to each other in the same manner or are you different persona in each of them um, how do you ensure that you are able to articulate your point of view in a constructive manner. Uh, because a lot of these are becoming screening way, uh, uh, ways of uh, looking at whether should I make a hiring decision to hire you or not. Uh, and I think it's extremely important to uh, keep that in mind even in the gig world as we uh, are moving towards the digital workspace. Uh, some bit on the elements of your personal brand would be body language, your image, the way you communicate, the credibility scores, or or your own per personal credibility, are you are you a person of your words, or are you um, committing something and not delivering? How do you manage difficult situations, and what is your social media presence? And I think extremely important for all of us to think through this uh, in a lot more detail in any kind of world of work that we are in, and all the more important when we are in the gig world of working, right? Um, we spoke about resumes and, and the uh, importance of di uh, digital resumes. Uh, the world is also moving towards video-based interviewing or video-based resumes. So uh, I think we are all need to uh, be in a, in, a, in a way to uh, create an elevator pitch, probably, uh, which is a 30-second, uh, uh, tell me something about yourself already uh, there on all the social media platforms. So it, it becomes an important element of catching the eye of a recruiter, probably helps you summarize skills, uh, experience relevant to the position. Uh, probably a lot of people today are looking at a one page of CV versus seven, eight, 10 pages CVs that used to be a norm in the past. Make it easier for people to understand um, and, and, and avoid technical jargons and get it designed uh, through professional CV writers. It doesn't cost you much, uh, but, but get that done. But also keep uh, a quick one slide of value proposition ready. If you were to think about your life as a gig worker, why should someone hire you? The difference between a CV and a value proposition document is CV is a reflection of what you have done so far. Um, Maybe great for you to find another job for yourself as a full-timer. But if you're in the business of winning work uh, as a gig worker, 
I would really be interested to know why should I award this work to you? And I think that's where the value proposition doc comes to uh, play. So I'm going to be cognizant of time. Um, we are at 11.42. Um, some bit on maintaining work-life balance, and I think this is something that really uh, is is um, becoming a part of everyone's life today as we are all working uh, remotely for our organizations. Um, uh, setting schedule, schedule is becoming an extremely important one. Um, commitment is becoming an extremely important one. Uh, I think COVID realities have made out of offices a little bit rare, but when you are out of office, uh, it's it's extremely important that you give uh, notifications to people because otherwise people will think, yeah, he's there, he's going to get the work done. What else does he or she have to do in, in times like these? So I think communication plays a huge and important role in you having a better work-life balance. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, this we spoke about, but I, I think what 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 it means when you're moving from a full-time role to a gig role or a solopreneur or a freelancer role is orient yourself in the world of legal framework. Um, it's it's not like you're getting a JD of a role or if it's not like you're getting your offer letter at the end of the day. It's more of who are you working with? Um, who are the parties that are involved? What is the scope of the project that you're working on? Um, are there changes and revisions that warrants you to ask for additional compensation or fees. Um, get it legally reviewed and vetted. Be sure on what you're putting in as your price per unit outcome uh, or, or the project. Um, uh, when do you terminate your contract? Uh, like, are you clear on when the contract ends? And be sure on the terms and conditions. A lot of these freelancing sites, of, uh, uh, of course, have a lot more stringent inbuilt uh, protocols to take care of all of these, but there will be those projects that you will enter or engage with individuals which will not be through freelancing sites or uh, will be an offline version of it or will be on the on the mode of an email exchange. So be very clear on how do you ensure you write a project agreement when you are engaging with someone as, as a freelance project worker. Um, Pricing becomes an extremely important element. Um, as a project manager uh, working for an organization, we are all only uh, getting paid our salaries. But when we get into the gig world, um, it's not going to be about salaries anymore. It's going to be about the right price point uh, uh, and, and how can you start demanding the right, right price point. Uh, there is always a fear that we have um, in the gig world that are we undercoating? Or are we getting underpaid? Um, and I think it's it's uh, it's a classic problem to have in a world where there is problem of abundance. And I think the you may have to start with pricing your projects lower, but eventually, as you make your mark and earn a better credibility rating, be sure of keeping an eye on on pricing the project uh, pretty well. Uh, how are you working on hourly projects? How are you getting paid on the project basis, the scope of work that you are getting involved into? So I think those are a few elements that you may want to keep in mind as you work through um, the gig world of work um, as, a, as a project manager. Um, managing projects as a freelancer would be extremely similar to that of you managing any projects for that matter. So define a scope, uh, define a date of launch and execution, manage the performance uh, and control it and ensure that the project closes on time and you hand it over to the right person appropriately. Th this world doesn't change in, in from what you're doing uh, as a, as a full-time worker or a gig worker, but it's more about uh, how are you ensuring the right parties are involved and, and are getting the right support from you as, um, as a lot of this will be eventually virtual um, and uh, is going to help uh, you get a better credibility rating at the end of the day. Some of the tools, uh, tools sorry, uh, you may all be aware of already uh, that that probably gives you uh, some versions and uh, for uh, tools uh, for managing your projects better. Uh, I'm gonna just skim through these. The must-have skills as a freelancer, I think innovation and creativity, learning and unlearning, 
every project that you work on, every assignment that you pick up, uh, every client that you work for um, would be different than the earlier one. And I think it will be extremely important how you learn fast, but also importantly, unlearn what you have learned in the prior engagement. Brand, brand management and marketing, we spoke about this in the social space. Analytical and logical thinking, um, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, business management skills, are we, are we ensuring that we are taking care of our freelancing or opportunity or an entrepreneurial venture appropriately and ensuring that we are being profitable in the business? Um, how, we, how are we organizing ourselves? How are we managing our time? Uh, how are we negotiating the right pricing, right scope, right uh, value at the end of the day with the clients? How are we communicating uh, with the clients uh, digitally, virtually, um, through phones, texts? Um, and of course, how are we becoming um, tech savvy in the world of work that we are moving into? Uh, and I think this will define our success uh, in the way we are um, in, in embarking our journey as a freelancer, if I were to say. Quickly, uh, I think, uh, in terms of skill sets, we just went through these, but soft skills, hard skills, hybrid skills, transferable skills, and job-specific skills are what is required. I'm going to not spend that much time on this because I think we all know what these are. But um, I think as we look at our future skills that are required by 2025, 2030, um, and with a view that everything is getting digitized, automated, uh, and, and the constant thought that we always have in our mind is, will I be replaced by a bot or, a, or, a, or an automated solution? And I think only one thing that I can say in this space is, what you can do as an individual is something that you will continue to do as an individual. Um, if the work that you're doing is repeatable in nature, that will continue to get automated. But it's our ability to look at it from a critical reasoning standpoint or analytical reasoning standpoint or emotionally uh, intelligently looking at each and every situation. How are we putting our cognitive abilities to use? How are we improving our uh, uh, digital literacy? And I think anything that we can do as human beings will continue to play a huge role in how we adapt ourselves to the world of work in 2025, 2030. Um, and I think being aware of surrounding situations uh, or, or even the world moving towards is going to be of extreme importance. So if there, were, if there were two things that I would say is adapt and adopt, um, don't be a laggard in this journey because I think it's extremely important that we become early adopters of these, uh, these new world of skills and the new world of work uh, because I think the earlier we adopt, uh, it becomes easier for us to become the market leaders in that space as well. Um, so that's a bit about what you can do as a freelancer. Just a bit about GigNow as a program that we run. Uh, we continue to always look for people um, for freelancing projects, uh, short-term assignments or gigs, uh, and, and we have a platform called gignow.com. Uh, I would encourage you, to, you all to sign up on that whenever there is a project or an opening uh, or, a, or a role or a gig that is available, one of us will definitely reach out to you. Um, the USP of this program is, of course, the world is virtual right now uh, and probably will continue to be virtual for the next couple of uh, quarters or, or probably a year at least, and will continue to uh, improve our experience on, on this model because uh, one of the USPs is that we don't treat this as a contractor management process. It's more about how do you give the right best-in-class employee experience for, for gig workers as well. So that's our program. Just, um, I mean, just sign up on gignar.com to know more about it, find gigs, uh, and, and you, will, you will probably see a lot more information on that. Um, I just spoke about the, the best aspects of being part of this program. Uh, we are also hosting a virtual career fair on 9th of September. Uh, the link is there below. You may want to take a quick screenshot of this. Uh, it's also there on LinkedIn um, and other social media platforms. More updates on this can be seen. 
um, if there are roles that you think you could uh, be, you would be interested to be part of, uh, reach out to us, sign up for the event, and and also sign up on gigna.com. So that's pretty much that I had in terms of what I had to present today. I trust this was helpful. I'll be more than happy to take any questions that we may have. Uh, thank you, Gopal. Um, just to add for our uh, participants, uh, we, uh, EY has shared some of the job opportunities that we dropped earlier with us uh, last month and that had been shared across uh, with everyone. And uh, Gopal, uh, if I'm right, uh, uh, you will continue to share as and uh, when. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we now open uh, the floor for questions. Um, we are seeing quite a few questions, and the first question, three questions are from Dr. Rastogi, sir. Uh, Dr. Rastogi has been uh, one of the founding members of the chapter. So sure. um, let's uh, take on the first question. Let's see, uh, do I see that? I think the question is, what are the key challenges of quality and fit start for the client in gig economy? Mm -hmm. from Dr. Quality of, uh, sorry, come again, I couldn't uh, get that question. What are the key challenges? Uh -huh. And then he puts in the bracket of quality of finished task for the client in the gig economy. So it depends on the maturity of the um, overall ecosystem as well, right? I mean, if you think about it, engaging with someone um, uh, from a more uh, uh, global uh, practice from a gig perspective, I think you would you would understand that you will probably get a better quality of work. But that's where um, best-in-class uh, crowdsourcing platforms come into picture because the way they would look at uh, engaging with um, uh, professionals is based on the machine learning algorithm uh, which awards you a rating as well. So after every project that you are working on, your client will give you a rating. So if your rating is 4.75 and above, which, which means that the work that you have done is of high quality, uh, the lower the uh, rating um, of, of uh, you, the chances of you getting uh, a better quality of work or you getting awarded the work is, is going to be lower as well. So I think the from an India perspective, the more we adapt to this world of work, uh, we will start seeing uh, the benefits a lot more. Um, and today, I think we have begun um, uh, very humbly. But if you see the numbers that I shared in the earlier slides, uh, I think um, quite a quite an encouraging number of professionals in India are already in this platform economy. And I think the more uh, we we um, sign up onto that idea, I think it will make our lives easier. Okay, uh, thank you, Gopal, for that. Uh, next question, uh, we ask, at a macro level, what do you see the Indian uh, education in the context of these global transformative changes? Any suggestions for educational institutions? So educational institutions have to really evolve from uh, looking at uh, imparting knowledge to also looking at improving skills and make people employable. Um, and I think a classic example uh, of, of that is uh, we, we pay a lot of attention to the um, master's degree or bachelor's degree, uh, uh, but there has to be uh, an element that people need to focus on also. How do we how do we complement that with a lot of micro skills that are required today for you to do your job well? Um, classic example is data science, data uh, analytics are not subject of its own uh, that are being taught in educational institutions today. I think these are additional certifications that you need to have. And I think that that shows that the fact that we, we probably need to work towards um, collaborating a lot more better as an industry and an academia to impart the the asks that we have as industry to the academic institutions to say this is what we want out of you and you are not preparing your your uh, students uh, to what we want uh, we can do a partnership with with train the trainer programs and and share our share our asks of you but you need to uh, evolve to be able to uh, work through 
work through that partnership as well. How many academic institutions are open for that idea today? I think that's where the challenge is. It's all about focus on placements. Uh, with the with the way the job market is evolving, placements will be very tough to find in the next few years um, because there will be not as many jobs uh, as many people that we have in in our country. Uh, as I said, we have a problem of abundance in there, so people need to really know. Uh, how to become a freelancer, and that's something that we are doing with um, uh, some of the pilot uh, uh, institutions as well, where we are sharing. Like this session, I'm doing these sessions for a lot of lot of academic institutions to tell the students uh, that they need to be open to the idea of freelancing as well. And the more freelancers we get at that level, it becomes easier. And and how do we then um, work towards their micro skills, micro tasks, micro learnings um, is is going to be an important one. Okay, thank you, Gopal. Um, the next question is from uh, Suya Strain from Value Momentum. My question is, uh, from organization point of view, in case of organization is planning to leverage gig model, how do we align gig workers, self-interest, to the organization business interest, where, uh, where they can feel a part of the company or the extended family? How do we, how do we align gig workers? self-interest, the organization business So I think it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I can I can give a parallel analogy that you may all want to think about, right? So we all need someone to come and paint our homes, right? Um, and, and we go to Urban Clap and get someone come and do the job for us. Uh, they ask us what our uh, uh, specifications are, what color of paint we need, uh, what color of what is our budget? Uh, when do they need? When do we need the uh, work done by? And they work accordingly. So I think gig workers come with that mindset any which ways. It's it's not about what I am bringing onto the table and you have to take the work. It's more about these other skills. I'm a good painter. I can come and do the paint job for you at your home. Um, you tell me what is it that you need. So I think. Uh, Big change management needs to occur from employer's perspective in being able to articulate what we want in a lot more refined manner to the gig workers, which is something that doesn't happen in an organizational structure. We tell that I want this and leave it at that and let people figure out what they need to do, which is where I think assignments fail. So as long as we have clearly articulated asks documented in terms of scope uh, and the KPI is defined, we will be we will not have that challenge as well uh, the amar the aspect of culture i would say is is more about uh, it's a it's a two way activity right i mean as long as we are focusing on uh, what the gig worker should in a broader business context be uh, mindful about which is treating people with respect treating treating people with integrity etc uh, i think that should be good the the bigger change management has to happen for organizations where they need to start thinking about uh, onboarding these uh, gig workers and yet make them feel included or inclusive uh, more from perspective of understanding the, the the understanding the needs of the gig worker and and allow him or her the space that they need to um, have to be able to work and and be successful in that space. So I think that's that's going to evolve, and I think we have we are we are seeing some great um, progress in many organizations. I'm seeing seeing a few names in the chat here, and I think we'll continue to evolve through this model as we speak. Okay, thank you, Gopal. Um, and the question I see here is uh, from Ramakrishna Chavduru. Um, will there be a challenge? Um, uh, will there be a challenge to bring clarity to complex requirements to avoid scope creep or scope change? Uh, I didn't get that question. You may have to repeat that, uh, Suma. Okay. Uh, in case of uh, big uh, projects, uh -huh. will there be a challenge to bring clarity to the complex requirements to avoid scope creep or scope change? I think there will be, right? I mean, that's what I, I shared in my presentation as well. Uh, I think this is one of the biggest worries a lot of gig workers have that uh, am I giving too much 
for the price that I have signed up for. Mm -hmm. uh and and should i really be doing that and then I'll, I'll go back again to the same analogy that i gave earlier uh imagine um it is uh so from a, from if if you were to re renovate your house and if you were to award a contract to a guy who comes and does all your uh furnitures painting wallpapers etc um if you were to really look at scope, uh, the scope with which someone starts the work and by the end of the entire process, uh, there will be a lot of deviations that happens, right? Um, and I think deviations happen on the ground of um, you not liking something that was built uh, as a customer or he having made a mistake uh, of, of putting in some something wrong uh, or vice versa. Um, as long as there is mutual acceptance of the final outcome, uh, I think that works well. Uh, at times, there is a trade-off. Uh, I think uh, sometimes we ask too much than what we should have asked for as a client. Uh, at times, uh, the, uh, the, the service provider gives in too much even without we asking uh, for, for, the, for the scope. Uh, how do we balance it out? And I, I think it's 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 a process of win some, lose some. In the larger scheme of things as a gig worker, nothing is going to go waste because it's an experience. Of course, you may not get paid for that additional 20 years of work that you did, hypothetically. I'm not saying that we will not get paid. But let's say, assuming it's so that it was a bit of deviation for various reasons, uh, I think as long as you're committed to work with this with this client, not just for this engagement, but think about this as larger re-engagement proposition, uh, I think that should be fine. Uh, and and I, I feel that's where the element of scope um, and, and uh, uh, our, our adherence to scope uh, has to be a little bit more open and flexible uh, from both the sides. And I think um, that that's gonna evolve. And again, the more we evolve in this model, uh, a lot of platform-based ways of working will automatically take care of these deviations and trigger uh, additional payment requests or trigger penalty clauses automatically. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gopal, for uh, sharing this insight. We have uh, quite a few questions uh, uh, coming in, but uh, uh, we have crossed the time. Uh, yeah. I wish we could answer all the questions right here, but I... Uh, uh, I'd like your uh, permission, uh, Gopal, to collect all these questions, and if we can uh, have it uh, mailed to you. Sure, sure. More them. than happy. More than happy. Yes. You can connect uh, me with with LinkedIn uh, on LinkedIn. Sorry, uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, we can continue the conversations there. Not an issue at all. But mm -hmm. all I hope is uh, this session was uh, of of some help to all of you uh, in in various walks of your life uh, in in getting more knowledge about gig economy. And what is it that uh, one needs to keep in mind? You be on the either side of gig, but I think this is coming coming in a very big way. Uh, and I think um, whatever we can do to adapt and adopt is something that we all should strive to do. Uh, and that's what my thought would be. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gopal, for that. Um, I will now request our uh, president, Mr. Madhav Reddy, uh, to give a vote of thanks. And JT, please uh, uh, the uh, feedback from the sandbox. Madhav, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Suma. And uh, thank you, Gopal. It was a very, very good uh, session. I think uh, we really applied the whole process of understanding how the new world and uh, and as we all know that the world has changed and changed it and yeah it would never be the same at least for the next few years. and uh, you know we all have to face it we have to all have to face it uh, take this new as people say new normal how to handle this new normal and prepare ourselves for the new change which is coming after us i'm yeah. sure you know, i thank thank you and thank all the pmi pcc who are there and also a lot of other guests who have joined us. A lot of people from, uh, you know, who are not a chapter have also joined. It's it's happy to see you. All. So you all have benefited by the fantastic session. So I hear, you know, share with us. It's very important that you know we realize 
uh, there is a change which is happening and just inevitable. It is not going to be the same. And how do we ourselves handle this new norm is is the challenge. And and uh, you know you, you you remember we all had a career enabler series, and the first one we had a series, you prepare your CV, and there the talk was uh, instead of two pages make it two pages. And now here Ayer is saying from two pages make it one page. So yeah, I think I appreciate that the change is very fast. Of course, that session was more on the on the, on the practical aspects of the environment, which would be normal. But we are not very sure whether those that norm is the same. At least for sure, the organizations and people have adopted the concept of working from home, and and have seen the advantage of advantage of this as well. They have seen this is coming up. Substantially, there is a lot of costs which are going down, and you would find that you know Infosys and all such organizations may not have might not have you know they might shrink. They would have we never know. You know, what's in store for all of us? And thank you, thank you, Gopal. It was a fantastic session. It is important for all of us to be prepared for what that is going across. And with that, I think. Thanks a lot. I think we should start looking for a website for all of us as far as CV is concerned. Yeah, v video based CVs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you so much, uh, Madhav. And uh, thank you once again, Gopal, for sharing your insights with us. Uh, this is a look into the future. And uh, if I'm not wrong, the future is right now. So. Absolutely. We we'll look forward for more insights from you uh, on LinkedIn and other forums as well. And thank you so much, participants, for joining in as a rhythm to this futuristic session. And we'll take your leave for now. The uh, feedback form will be sent to you across as well. And the link uh, for the previous name is also at the end of the feedback form. Thank you so much. And have a great weekend. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Take bye -bye. care. Papal, bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. bye. bye.